Welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here. We're live from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake, also playing live out of St. Paul on SPNN. We're glad to have you here for this uh, talk, call-in show. So if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to call in there at the number 651-747-3838. If uh, you want to see past shows, go to youtube.com backslash speechlessmn. And then if you have uh, don't want to call in but want to leave some comments, email there, speechlessmn at gmail.com. We have a lot of uh, information in the first part of the show before we get to the main part, which is going to be an appellate court hearing in Minnesota that was heard Wednesday about Minnesota Voters Alliance versus Anoka Hennepin uh, County School District. And this is all about the laws of transparency, where the school district is spending money uh, advocating for their levies and referendums when it is uh, against the law to do that, or their levies, their bondings, when it is against the law for them to do that. And uh, it was just, it's a, it was a fascinating hearing, a fascinating discussion, good back and forth. Uh, uh, you could just really see the different personalities of the appellate court justices, uh, just, uh, judges that were there. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to play some clips of an interview after the hearing. And later on this week, I'll actually have the whole hearing uh, up on the internet so you can hear the hearing and then watch uh, the interviews afterwards. I, th I think uh, you, you'll be very informed and you even want to have your kids watch it, especially the third question in the interview uh, because it addresses um, the, the youth, why the youth are so important and why the youth are will and are going to pay attention to this type of activity uh, that, that our school districts are doing, which is violating the law in criminal activity now, and it needs to, it, it needs to stop. Well, before we get into that, we got a lot of um, other little subjects of things that are going on around the nation and uh, uh, closer to home. Um, but one thing is there's a Supreme Court ruling that came out about guns that I thought was correct. I think it was a unanimous decision. And it basically said if you're a convicted felon, uh, you have the right to sell your guns. Uh, you know, and instead of turning them over for the police to sell them, you, it's still your property unless you've lost the property in some... Uh, illegal activity or whatever, but say you, your activity wasn't gun related. You get to choose the person you want to take third party possession over your guns to have them sold or whatever. The state just can't take them for you, then sell them and then keep the money. Uh, but you can sell them and, and if you owe the state money because you're being fined, well then the state can uh, get the money that way. Uh, but I thought that was a good decision. That's the right process uh, to take place. Um, so, very interesting aspect. Um, now, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk. We're going to talk a little bit. Well, this gets into guns again, but more, more or less power and authority. And in Minneapolis, uh, a police officer is charged. Not that he has done this. Uh, but he has been charged with assaulting four people in two separate bar fights after identifying himself as an officer. And this is, these are federal charges. U U.S. Attorney's Office um, is filing these charges against him. And the Michael Lewis Griffin, a 40 of Oakdale, so in our viewing audience here, um, is also charged with lying on official police reports and civil disobedience dispositions and at trial. You know, I am so excited that the U.S. Attorney is, office is doing this. I hope it's not true. 
okay? I don't want officers to lie. I don't want them just going willy-nilly beating people up. Um, so, but if it is true, I'm glad the U.S. Attorney's Office is doing this because uh, in court cases I've seen, I've, I've been in front of three, in three court cases where the Maplewood police say, yeah, we can lie at any time, um, where the uh, Rosemont police falsified their reports in order to uh, get a charge going. Um, and the jury saw that there were false reports and where false reports were made against another news reporter also uh, while well, in the Dakota County Sheriff's Department, uh, the court deputies. And it's just, there has to be a consequence to these people who choose to lie. And this needs to take place. Uh, and so it's good that the U.S. Attorney's Office is pursuing this because it needs to needs to happen. Um, also, the U.S. Supreme Court is now going to be uh, taking up a case against a, a Los Angeles Police Department for covering up evidence that would have prevented a man from sitting in jail for 27 months prior to his trial. And so uh, this thing has been a peeled all the way up to now the U.S. Supreme Court is taking it and basically they're saying LAPD you can't cover up evidence you know and that's the game that's going on and that's the game that's going on in Dakota County where they have video evidence that this reporter did nothing wrong but they refused to give it to him until five days before the hearing a probable cause hearing and the the guy was fighting left and right ended up with three different judges on his case, uh, telling the story, trying to get things done. Finally, they finally did bring an out-of-county judge that isn't normally working that uh, courtroom, doesn't know the deputies. And uh, finally, the judge had to dismiss the case for lack of probable cause. The judge also, in the transcript, falsified some of the testimony that was given. Um, why? He just didn't need to, but he wanted to make it look a little bit like the deputies had some reason to do something. Uh, but that information was incorrect and wrong. It was all hearsay evidence, too. So anyway, uh, I think the Supreme Court hopefully will rule that, yes, if you hide evidence, there should be criminal prosecution brought against you for um, because you're denying somebody their freedom and their right uh, and their right and their constitutional liberties. And what, what did we just have come down uh, a couple days ago? Uh, five big banks, multinational banks, were fined $5 billion for price fixing on interest rates, which they made boatloads of money on, so the fine who does the fine affect? It affects the shareholders. Okay, was there criminal prosecutions brought against the owners, the, the people that actually did the price fixing? No. Do they still have their jobs? I, I don't know. We need to know that. But these people who did the price fixing should be held accountable. They should be thrown in jail and taken out of their positions. Believe me, the talk where they say, oh, these people are too smart and too valuable, we can't get them, leave, you know, get them out of the business, otherwise the industry will be suffering and hurt. Uh, you know, baloney. That's just a bunch of baloney. This is all protection for people who are, are um, violating the law and creating this lack of transparency. And then it's costing the shareholder, it's costing the, the uh person buying the mortgages or getting loans because of the price fixing going on. And so, you know, this whole thing of covering up for crimes is, is a bad, <laughs> it needs to be done. And when it's public officials or corporations that are doing this, they need to be held accountable. And, you know, a lot of people disagree with this, uh, People's United decision that corporations are individuals and persons. And here's where I, and, and I agree with that decision. They are, 
uh, but corporations do have a limited liability, okay? And I, I think, though, if they're persons, that limited liability should be taken away. And these people that committed these crimes need to be held accountable and suffer prison sentences for what they're doing. Other people have, so why is the U.S. Justice Department not going after these uh, people that were involved in this price fixing at these, at these banks? Um, I don't know. We, we, we need to have answers on that, and pressure needs to be put that way. Okay, uh, interesting, <laughs> interesting stuff. Um, Pro-life. Uh, I want to move on to that, and this will tie in a lot with the rest of what we're doing. Uh, Pro-life, government shutdown, schools. Um, there is a... Uh, paying capable house, uh, U.S. house bill that passed that if a child can feel pain and, and they can in the womb that you got to end abortions. And so that passed the house. I just wanted to play one clip uh, from a um, representative from uh, Wisconsin, the 7th District, Wausau area. And it was, I thought it was a fantastic speech and really calling out the feminists, the Democrat Party uh, that says they're for the poor and the voiceless, and yet they want to, you know, kill the poor and the voiceless. So let's hear what he has to say. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, this is a bill that is protecting babies that can survive outside the womb. Uh, this is babies who can feel pain. Um, that this institution wouldn't stand up for those vulnerable children in our society uh, is a sad day for this institution. I, uh, I have seven children. Uh, this is my six. This is Marty V. Um, this picture was taken with the two of us the day she was born. Uh, she's now five years old. She's gregarious, awesome, fun, uh, the most beautiful joy in our family. The way the law stands today is that the day before this picture was taken, it would have been legal to abort Mighty V. I want to talk about women's rights. This is a little girl. This is a little baby girl who will one day grow up to be a woman. Let's stand up and protect this little girl, not the day that she was born only, but also the day that she's in the womb. Let's protect her from the pain of abortion. The silent screams of those babies who were aborted in the womb that aren't heard because they don't have voices in this institution defending them. I listen, Madam Speaker, I listen to the floor debate day after day, whether in this chamber or on C-SPAN, and I hear the other side talk about how they fight for the forgotten, they fight for the defenseless, they fight for the voiceless, and they pound their chest and they stomp their feet. You don't have anyone in our society that's more defenseless than these little babies. And we're not talking, listen, I'm, I believe in life at conception. I know my colleagues aren't going to agree with me on that. But can't we come together as an institution and say, we're going to stand with little babies that feel pain? We're going to stand with little babies that can survive outside the womb? Ones that don't have lobbyists, that have money, that can't rally, that can't offer contributions to your campaign? Don't we stand with those little babies? If you stand with the defenseless, with the voiceless, you have to stand with little babies. Don't talk to me about cruelty in our bill. When you look at little babies being dismembered, feeling excruciating pain, if we can't stand to defend these children, what do we stand for in this institution? What do we stand for in America if we can't stand up for the most defenseless and voiceless among us? I yield back. Yeah, great. Great speech. Um, yeah, and that's just, that's why everything else falls apart and, and is falling apart. Because we do have this culture of death and, and, and it extends into every other aspect of, of our society, the valueless society, principle-less society. And um, another thing that's happened that's in the new news, um, 
is this a man who has spoken out, a black man, about the number of babies that are black that get aborted. Forty percent of babies, according to him, are being, black babies are being aborted. So your chance of life as a black person is of, of even coming to life is astronomical because you're being killed before you're born. And what he then went after NAACP and he calls them the National Association of Aborted Color People. And of course, NAACP cares nonetheless about abortion. They won't talk about it. Yeah, which, which is just a, uh, a, a tragedy. And of course, that's why the NAACP is so compromised, because they're really not about colored people. Because if they were, they would be crying out against abortion. But if you've seen the movie Ma, uh, Maafa, M-A-A-F-A, -A Maafa.com, if you've seen that, uh, Maafa21.com, uh, if you've seen that movie, the, you realize that the, many of the liberal black leaders like uh, Sharpton and Jesse Jackson got paid off. They were pro-life and then all of a sudden they changed their mind because they gained some political advantage there. Uh, so in this lawsuit, or well, actually, when he made these statements about NAACP being the National Association of uh, Aborted Colored People, then NAACP sued him. And a two-year court battle ensued, and the man won. Uh, and uh, so, <laughs> you know, that's the extent that the NAACP will go to try to protect their name from being smeared, but they won't protect that a black baby's being killed and at such a high rate. All right, we got a uh, call coming in here. Caller, do you have a comment or question? Well, uh, mostly comment. Okay. I watch C-SPAN quite often to listen to the debate. And actually, I did see some of this debate as well that was on the floor. Uh huh. And one, because see, I'm always looking for inconsistencies in the law and inconsistencies in philosophy because that's where you can figure out whether or not if people really have an idea about what they're talking about or not. Okay. And and so I heard nobody. Uh, talk, when they were talking about this issue and about this particular legislation, none of them made a correlation to the fact that I believe it's like 38 states that have fetal homicide laws that say if a woman is pregnant and somebody were to assault her and harm her to such an extent that she loses the baby that they can actually be charged right. with fetal homicide. And, and it's fascinating is that some of those states, I, I think like 23 of those states, actually then actually uh, protect uh, under their fetal homicide laws uh, the earliest state of pregnancy. And believe it or not, Minnesota is one of those states, from right. what I understand. I haven't really done a lot of research in this area, but I started thinking about that when I was listening to C-SPAN, well, why aren't they bringing up this inconsistency to be able to support their position? Because I, I think that if you were to give up the statistics about how many states believe that the fetal homicide well, what can support their position? So it's just only sort of an observation uh, from my perspective. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know that it means anything other than it's an observation, which right. is ironic when you're talking about this issue 
And then you've got another body of laws that says, well, this is fetal homicide, but then you've got another body of laws that says it's not if it's under certain different circumstances. So right. anyway, that was all my comment was. All right. Thank you. I, I, I think that's a good point. Uh, the, o the only reason I can think of why they didn't mention uh, the fetal homicide, if they didn't, I, you may have watched the whole thing, I didn't, um, was because this was about pain, you know, so the main subject was pain. Uh, another whole issue on uh, the uh, young babies in the womb, I, that fetus means little one, it's just a Latin term for little one, which means baby. Uh, so that whole concept of uh, uh, a fetus isn't a baby, that's just not, that's just, just a lie. <laughs> you know, that's what the word means, baby, <laughs> you know. So that's just part of the deception of words. But also inheritance rights is a big issue. If, if you're not born uh, and, but you, uh, you have full inheritance rights if, you're, if your mom is pregnant with you and your dad dies or your grandpa right, grandpa dies or grandma dies and you get inheritance, you're one of the kids. You get an inheritance from that. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, uh, who knows why they didn't do it this time. I, my guess is just because it dealt with pain uh, and they were just focusing on that issue. Uh, so... But that's a good question. Um, and in some states, I'm sure the fetal homicide would depend on whether the mother wanted the baby or not. You know, because at full term, you can still abort your baby. Uh, so, in interesting. Okay, well, and, and getting on then, you know, from the pro-life issue, uh, I got to say that we're, we're moving to Mark Dayton now in the shutdown, but with the shutdown, you know, I'm telling you, Dayton's really responsible for the death of a lot of babies in Minnesota. Uh, his position, and this is where I think it's very hypocritical of him to go to a Minnesota prayer breakfast and call himself a Christian when he's for the killing of uh, viable human beings. Uh, and and they're all viable in the womb uh, so anyway but he's pushing this shutdown and we have some videos here uh, of the prior shutdown so we're going to play a clip about some comments that was made from this was two years ago well it doesn't matter i'll figure it out two weeks ago these are comments from two weeks ago about uh, the shutdown or potential shutdowns or whatever here's what dayton has to say But could you be open to more tax cuts? I, I you know, I, you know compromise, compromise means you agree uh, things you don't uh, agree with. And we're obviously, I'm going to have to compromise if we're going to get a resolution and avoid the serious problems that occurred in 2011. We're going to have to get, uh, everyone's going to have to compromise and, and accept something that they don't agree with. And, you know, I'm willing to do my part in that. I was willing to do my part in that in 2011. Speaking of 2011, do you agree with uh, Leader Thiessen that what the Republicans laid out is a recipe for a shutdown? I hope, I hope not. I, I can't speak for, you know, the, the House, uh, you know, the majority or the minority caucuses. I, I mean, all this is, you know, speculative at this point. Um, again, as I said, there are going to be need to be compromises made if it's, uh, anything's going to be resolved. I'm hopeful that Enough of the legislators were around as I was in 2011 to remember how awful that that was, and and you know allowed not to repeat it. But there's all you know that remains to be seen. It depends on everybody willing to you know to make the necessary compromises and come to necessary agreements. So, so you know I, I don't want to. I'm not, but I'm not going to venture forth into predicting <coughs> that myself. Governor, how? All right. Um, what's, what's interesting here, um, remember, he doesn't know where things are in the shutdown or what's going to happen, if it's going to happen, okay? 
You just got to understand that right now. Okay, that was his position, but something else is going on here. And right at that point in time in his life, he knew other things were taking place that he did not expose at that point in time. So anyway, we're going to go back to 2011 and, um, and hear what he had to say about the shutdown then and, and then tie it in with the shutdown that's coming up. So let's, let's hear what he has to say. And it also, and this was not uh, apparent to me or other uh, of our negotiators at the time of June 30th, uh, but the Republicans said fu subsequently, publicly, that they would take all these policy items, everything from banning stem cell research to uh, abolishing teacher tenure to abrogating uh, contractual bargaining rights of, of employees, uh, all that was going to be taken off of the negotiating table so we would be able to focus just on the budget. That was not clear to us uh, at all on the night of June 30th, and and so, you know, really put it in a different uh, context. Uh, and it also, uh, have, uh, they uh, have agreed to my $500 million bonding bill, which uh, would go a long way to putting more people to work in Minnesota. It sounds, uh, Governor, without putting words in your mouth, it sounds like this could have been worked out on June 30th without a shutdown, except for miscommunication. Well, uh, the, you know, we were in constant communication, but uh, I don't know whether there was miscommunication or, or subsequent revision. I, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, you know, what's, what's done is done, and the important thing is now to get an agreement very quickly. Uh, we have our groups working on that uh, today. We've given them 10 o'clock tonight deadlines. You know, what's interesting about this is there uh, – the, the shutdown um, and the information wasn't subsequent to the shutdown. There was an offer made in writing well before the shutdown. There was an agree. there was a, this is what we're willing to do. And, and, uh, and in my understanding, agreements were made, but what Dayton shut the government down. And then when, when he signed the bill, it was the same one that was put on the table before the shutdown. So he blames the Republicans, but the Republicans made the offer and then he finally accepted it. So it was all on him. He could have accepted it right away. Um, so right, we got a caller right now. So caller, you have a comment or a question? Tim Kinley. Yes. Thanks for talking about this significant issue. You and trying to uh, decipher what the game is because all we see is what's in the commercial media. Now, I hear that they're going to have a special uh, session on their education bill, their largest bill. And uh, they're going to have it in a tent outside on the Capitol lawn. And, of in course, I find that perplexing. When the commercial media, they're showing all the leaders going over at the governor's office in private chambers away from the public Nobody able, no cameras, no, no citizens being able to sit in like they can in a courtroom. And they're cutting deals and they're trading deals and people are giving them this and they're giving them that. Right. All that in secrecy. And, and uh, then now they're saying they're going to have a, a circus out on the uh, Capitol Lawn. Now, of course, I tend to think even if they have the circus, which they should, <laughs> because it would save somebody uh, the money, uh, uh, but it shouldn't be on the capital lawn. It should be on the governor's lawn because that's where they uh, are working all the deals out anyway. So why 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 not have the have it right outside the uh, front doors so and come out in their press conferences? But my question to you, Tim, is okay. So you know they've had a lot of special sessions, and everybody's taken that into their income of the year. You know they've got that money spent for their toys and their boats and their TVs. So, you know, there's a lot of people who would love, love to see a special session because that's an, uh, kind of a bonus pop, and they probably get time and a half for all you know. But uh, <laughs> the thing that I have, if, I mean, are the governor and his advisors that, that uh, out of touch that they don't know, well, we shouldn't shut the Capitol down the next day after the legislative session because, you know, if we shut it down the next day and we say we're starting the work, then how are all the senators and all their aides and all their staff and all the all other people are going to get all their personal belongings out? You would think that would take a month to move that out. 
So what what I'm reading into this whole uh, picture that they're they're uh, publicizing is that uh, you know during the last uh, set, the days in the session the last weeks when they apparently do most of all their work because they claim they have to pass bills at three a.m. in the morning that actually instead of concentrating and focusing on getting their reports done they're actually packing to move right now if if this isn't just getting completely out of control there what, what's, you know I don't know. Uh, right. uh, uh, what could be said? So I don't know what the problem. Could somebody please give us some accurate information yeah. or tell us what's really going on, or is this just well, a uh, okay, caller? Here's the uh, here's, the, here's the deal. What's other, going uh, on here? And all these yeah, here's what's going on here. Okay, I think you raise a very good point about the they're packing to leave. So how can they have a special session? And I, I think they uh, everything's already done. I, the, this whole deal about a special session was just a spoke, smoke and mirrors. And there was an article that came out today that uh, Senator Bach and the, the DFL and the Senate did a study to what the effect of the uh, shutdown would be and the blame would be put on the Republicans. And so this was a calculated study done before the end of the session to see what kind of leverage the DFL could get out of shutting down the government and who would take the blame. So everything's done. It's going to be another repeat of 2011 where Dayton goes and agrees to everything that was agreed before the shutdown, but they're going to blame the Republicans like they did in 2011. But it's really the DFL shutting it down. And is Dayton going to compromise? He could have compromised. I think one of the big issues there is their K-12 uh, having, you know, uh, four-year-olds in kindergarten. Republicans aren't going to do it. There's not going to be any compromise. There, there shouldn't be. That's a whole new program. And you didn't have your DFL support you, your senators who control the Senate. They didn't support you. They didn't pass it. So, Dayton, they didn't support you in that, but Dayton, you had control of the House and the Senate two years prior to this, and you didn't pass that. So, what are you trying, you know, this is a game. This shutdown is all on Dayton. And, you know, unbelievably, the House and the Senate you know, worked together, got the compromise done, and Dayton's just Throwing a hissy fit, you know. Uh, so this is all. This is what's going on. I think I like the analogy of setting up a tent for the circus. <laughs> that's a that's a good one. But this is all all done. It's all smoke and mirrors. And uh, if the Republicans give on this 4K, the Republicans are going to hurt uh, big time. And he did veto the education bill. Um, and Dayton is the one that's not compromising here. And, you know, they, he, he got a lot of what he wanted. The Republicans bargained. The DFL gave, gave stuff away. So um, there's just no need for this. And uh, the DFL should have been harder on Dayton to get him to stop this. Okay, well, we're running out of time already. Um, let's see. Let's go. We're going to have to go into our, uh, drop some of these other things. Uh, Minnesota Voters Alliance versus the Anoka Hennepin County uh, School District. Uh, big, big time lawsuit. And Eric Cardell uh, was the attorney in this case for Minnesota Voters Alliance. And um, after the hearing, I interviewed him, and he kind of gave the the whole history of what was going on here uh, in the court case and prior history. But uh, these comments that are coming here next are just his comments about the whole case uh, in general. And I thought they were very good, very informative. But this is about the government taking money from you to use against you and your positions and your values. And that's illegal. Okay, and Minnesota Voters Alliance 
and a number of attorneys are working hard to hold the government accountable for doing wrong actions and that's what this case is about. So let's hear what Eric Cardle has to say. My name is Eric Cardle. I just completed the Court of Appeals argument in the Minnesota Voters Alliance and Don Hazinga appeal in the campaign finance case involving the Anoka Hennepin School District. Uh, the two issues uh, before the court were one, is the school district uh, committee that needs to report under the statutes regarding its campaign finance expenditures? And then two, uh, what is the difference between the school district informing uh, the public uh, through brochures and what uh, be, and then promoting uh, through brochures so these two distinctions uh, were argued the Minnesota Voters Alliance position favors transparency and disclosure by school districts regarding campaigns the principal concern is that the uh, there's a, a temptation when big government contracts are uh, available through school districts for contractors, uh, construction companies, and others to influence the uh, election process. If people are going to make money off of government contracts, and uh, in this case where a vote is required, uh, shouldn't that vote uh, be, un uh, be in unimpeded in a sense? Um, and shouldn't there be plenty of information about who is reporting? So the yes groups and the no groups need to report their campaign expenditures. Shouldn't the school district uh, report as well? In one case, the St. Louis County School District case, the school district worked so closely with the contractor um, uh, on the project that pre-election, uh, these tax money and the private money of the contractor were intermingled and spent on uh, campaign brochures. And um, that case is, uh, we've won at the Minnesota Supreme Court, we've won remand in the Office of Administrative Hearings, and now we're another round. We're now at four or five years of litigation trying to get in the bottom of what happened in St. Louis County School District. These are very important elections involving tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars of taxpayer money, and the legal requirement is that the people vote. And the legal requirement is that people who are trying to influence the voters need to report. And those people include corporations, but also include school districts. And they all need to report. We need, uh, we need sunshine. We need financial transparency. Uh, you know, some of these school district bond referendum have failed by 85% to 15%. This is a Mountain Lake case. And you look at the Mountain Lake School District, and it, the school board was influenced by the general contractor, Johnson Controls, Inc. How does the school board get so out of sync with the voters? Well, by listening to the contractors. And so we have to be skeptical of these propositions in the first instance, and we need reporting to know what's going on behind the scenes. We don't want the profit motive of the contractors driving our school district uh, building decisions. Uh, what should drive that is what's good for the children, what's good for the community, not what the general contractors want. So today was just a, another step, an important step, in probably six or seven years of litigation in tr attempting to open up uh, school districts and local governments to uh, the public uh, campaign expenditure requirements. They, they have to comply with the requirements just like we do. In the end, uh, Minnesota Voters Alliance, Don Hazinga, the rest of us are going to continue to fight, and it's a lifelong work, to open up these uh, deals so that we can see what's going on. And the success of this litigation will create a platform for a better run government. In the end, if we don't do things like this, then the government will be managing the situation. And what's really important is that we manage the situation, and here the laws exist to do that. So by the activists here challenging the school districts on the campaign financial requirements, we will show that the courts can hold these school districts accountable, and then we'll get good financial reports, and then all of a sudden the sunshine will be this great disinfectant, and we won't see these contractors getting so invested with the school districts that they're running the campaigns rather than the school boards themselves. And then one last note, and I, I should add this, is that the position of the Minnesota Voters Alliance, Donna Zing and the rest, are the school districts shouldn't be spending taxpayer money anyway promoting a ballot question. Right now, we're in the stage of litigation where we're trying to force them to disclose their spending. But the next step, of course, is why are they involved at all? Because once that ballot question goes in the ballot, it's sacred. It's the yes voters and the no voters duking it out, level playing field. Once the government gets involved and spends tens of thousands of dollars, St. Anthony School District was spending more than $20 a vote to get their referendum passed. 
Is that something we want statewide? No, we want, we want a fair fight between the yes and the no votes on the question. And that's only going to happen if we press for that. And so we believe in the end that the spending the school district is doing promoting the ballot question is not authorized by law and violates the First Amendment rights of those who are opposed to the ballot question. Think about that. That I go out as a citizen and I oppose a ballot question and I raise $10,000 and I spend it. And then the school district spends $100,000 saying that my stuff is inaccurate, not, not good, not persuasive. Well, is that fair to me? Because that $100,000 of taxpayer money spent is my money too. And it's being used to squelch my voice on a matter of public concern, that ballot question. And so this is a fight that's worth fighting. And um, please support the Minnesota Voters Alliance, Don Zinga. Thank you, Mr. Kinley. And um, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. I mean, th this is just not right. And it is so inappropriate, extremely inappropriate, uh, to use public funds to spend $20 per vote or, or any public funds to vote to use against you. So the, it doesn't happen with constitutional amendments. The Republicans' uh, caucus in the DFL caucus, if they, uh, from the legislature, they don't go and collect your tax money and then use it for or against a constitutional amendment. No, that's all private money. But here what we got with school districts, city councils, uh, school boards, they're going out and uh, using your money against you. And it's costing you quite a bit of money uh, in the process. Well, let's go on to the next question, uh, or I ask him a few questions, so let's uh, watch that. From what I was hearing in the courtroom here, uh, my understanding is this is determining what is promotional material, and you're saying that just because they put information out, it's promotional material, even though this material had statements that looked like it was promotional, you're really not caring. They put it out, it was beyond the legal notices requirement, therefore it's promotional. Right, that the, basically any campaign expenditures the school district does other than like printing the, paying for printing the ballots or election judges, the legal notice and so forth, everything else has to be reported because it's discretionary. And so when they use their discretion and start sending out mailers and start sending out uh, promotional brochures, if they spend more than $750, they have to report like the rest of us. And what was really awkward about their arguments today was that their arguments uh, made on behalf of diluting what promotional means, basically saying you have to say vote yes uh, in order to have to report, otherwise you can do anything. That, that also covers all the other committees, the corporations, everyone else. And so the stalking horse here is the big corporation that's going to benefit from the school district contracts. If the school district wins here, then they're going to be putting out all sorts of brochures because how much money would you spend to make a $10 million profit? Well, you'd spend a lot of money to help the school board pass a referendum that meant 10 million in your pocket. These are huge bond referenda. They're huge building projects, hundreds of millions of dollars, and these corporations know that, and they view our school districts as an easy mark. Now, with respect to the school, uh, school district citizens, they have to be watchful about these proposals and ensure that these projects are in the best interest of the, the children and best interest of the school district, but how can you do that without the information? It makes a huge difference to a citizen if they know that the money being used to promote the ballot question is the corporation's money or the public school's money. Uh, you know, where is the yes committee? In, in St. Anthony School District, for example, the reason why the school district had to spend so much money is there really wasn't a constituency for a yes committee. Now, in Orono, that was different. Orono, there was a huge yes committee, and the school district uh, was more reliant on the yes committee contributions. But there's all sorts of cooperation between the yes committees and the school districts, and what we want is transparency. We want that opened up. If the yes committee is receiving funds from the general contractor for the project, well, the yes committee has to report that. Uh, the school district's position is if they received the money and spent it on the campaign, the same brochures, they wouldn't have to report it. 
So it's, it's a crazy situation the school districts have put themselves in, and this is not uh, unintentional. We've been litigating this for six years. These are the best lawyers in the state, learned counsel, and, and we're arguing with them, and they're not trying to get to a place where the law is reconciled to their conduct. This is multiple litigation, lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit, and why are we having so much difficulty with the school district conforming their conduct to the law? It seems like they want to change the law to conform to their conduct. And oh boy, would any criminal defendant like that, right? But the point is, that's not how it works. The way it works is we have to work through the legal process to determine the legal requirements for the school district, and the legal requirements for the school district must be the same as any other committee. And that's the problem for the school district arguing that, well, if you're not actually saying voting yes, you can do anything, well, then that would be true for any other committee. And, and boy, would the, the, the shoe be on the other foot if there was a no committee who was well-funded who was not against a school district referendum and they weren't reporting. Oh, right? And so, so it's, we should have one legal standard for the yes committees, the no committees, the school districts, the local governments, uh, state agencies, and it should all be report, report, report. But I, I also need to mention again that while we're saying report, 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 what we're actually arguing is they report their illegal conduct because they don't have authority to spend the money advocating uh, these positions. And they, they also, it's a violation of the First Amendment rights of those who oppose them. All right, we got a little time left. We're going to go right to the next question. It's about a 10-minute piece, so let's, let's play this. The, the judges here were talking about how well they were familiar with the Abrams case. And almost in the joking sense, of, oh, we're really familiar with that. Were they in on some of that decision, or were they overruled by the Supreme Court? What's kind of that history? Well, there's, there's a lot of history here because of the preceding cases. So uh, the first case was the Orono School District case. And in the case of Orono, this is really what caught our eye. They were so organized in Orono, they had uh, previously failed to pass a referendum. So they actually put out an ad to hire a new person on staff to run the next campaign. So they, they actually advertised. Later they got a blue ribbon from some sort of national committee for running such a well-structured well campaign. So they hired a political director, I'm not sure what the title was, and then that person organized the whole school district, the staff, the communications firms, everyone, to run the campaign. And now there was a well-funded yes committee in conjunction with the campaign, and that was the first case, and we, our complaint was dismissed. And then we, we learned something from that. Then the second case was the St. Anthony School District case. Um, and that was similar there, you know, because, particularly because they scheduled the election in a very cold winter month. There was low turnout. It ended up being $20, $25 a vote that they spent. Uh, there were like uh, 3,000 votes total and $75,000 spent or something like that. I don't recall the exact numbers. But the point is they spent a lot of money compared to how many votes were, were uh, cast. And that was challenged all the way to the Court of Appeals. And that Court of Appeals decision, the school district won, but it was a Pyrrhic victory because the Court of Appeals said school district wins, but this is the way to do these complaints. So they gave us the roadmap. And then the next case was the St. Louis County School District case. That's the one where we lost in the Office of Administrative Hearings, the Court of Appeals reversed, the Supreme Court took it and affirmed. So in the Abramson case, three Court of Appeals judges agreed with our position, and all seven Supreme Court justices agreed. So that's 10 appellate judges agreeing with our position. Now, the Star Tribune editorialized, and this is kind of funny, they editorialized, well, you know, Justice Page wrote this decision, and we think it's a good decision, but we, uh, you know, then it looked like, but we're a little concerned what Mr. Colonel's up to. And, and, and I'll tell you what I'm up to. Uh, we're up to transparency on behalf of the school districts regarding spending on, on school district referenda. The Star Tribune editorial board has nothing to be concerned, and they should join our side full-heartedly because we're going to bust open uh, these doors of secrecy, and we're going to open up what's actually going on. Why are all these school district b uh, construction referendums going forward? And the reason is uh, companies are feeding at the trough. They're coming and feeding at the government trough, and what we need to do is make sure that if they're using uh, private dollars and taxpayer dollars to promote the ballot question, that it's disclosed so that the public knows they're feeding at the trough. No different than money coming from uh, wealthy people to candidates. It's that we're concerned about the same quid pro quo corruption that you have there. 
All the campaign finance laws regarding candidates apply to ballot questions as well, particularly when there's a contract right there. There's money to be made. At least with the candidates, you have to, okay, the candidate gets elected to Congress, it has to go through the House and Senate, then it has to do this and it has to do that. But with the, here, the school district contracts, it's right there. The bond is going to be issued, and the money's going to be handed over to the general contractor and handed over to the construction companies. Okay, so that was Abramson. And then Abramson came back and they, we fought over what promotional information was, and we won that, and that's where the school district was reprimanded. And then they filed a report that was inadequate, again, because I think they're concerned if they did a full disclosure that it would really look like it was illegal, criminal, and so they only did a partial disclosure, and now we're working on, uh, in the OAH, another legal violation regarding campaign finance reporting. Uh, and one of the things uh, I should mention that's kind of funny about this, and we're kind of documenting this now, was that in the uh, Minnesota Supreme Court, the Abramson case, uh, the lawyer for the school district was making uh, very good arguments, but one argument came out kind of funny, and that was, well, it, it can't be illegal because we can spend up to $750 without reporting. And, and Justice uh, Paul Anderson, who's a very uh, funny uh, man, he said, well, geez, you sound like the lawyer for Al Capone. <laughs> And, that, and that's how uh, sometimes I feel in these cases. But to, to proceed now, so we got through Abramson. Then an interesting case happened in the city of Lionel Lakes, the first case where we found a city with a referendum uh, that uh, they had promoted. It hadn't filed a report. And so we, uh, Mike Trias, and, with the support of Minnesota Voters Alliance, brought that case. And the Office of Administrative Hearings uh, said, yes, you failed to report and they were similarly uh, found to be reprimanded. So they got punished as well. And so now we have the school districts and the cities being accountable to the law, and then now it's this case, the Anoka Hennepin School District case, and we've already been on appeal once by the Office of Administrative Hearings and we reversed them. So if you'd imagine, we've had uh, one reversal in Abramson, affirmed by the Supreme Court, and we had a reversible, uh, a reversal also in Hennepin and okay, had been county, the first appeal. This is the second appeal, and now we're zeroing in on the merits. And the merits involve um, what we discussed before. So when the Court of Appeals judges here today said, we're very familiar with this set of cases, it's this body of case law that's developing. And it's very important case law. Basically, what we're saying is that no, the school districts aren't running our lives and then coming to get our approval. We, the people, are deciding to issue the bonds. The school, the school board is our servant. They're coming to us and presenting us with an idea, and we get to decide. And as we decide, we want to know, school district, how, mu how much money you've spent, our money you've spent on this campaign. And it's fair for us to have that information because it's relevant to whether we're going to award these bonds, which you'll get the revenue from. And so they're familiar. And I think one of the things just, uh, I should state is these cases are very exciting, and I'm getting a, we're getting a lot of interest from a lot of people. And, and the reason is, is on these issues of statutory interpretation, interpreting ordinances, interpreting charters, and so forth, people aren't ideologically committed. Those constitutional issues, everyone's ideologically committed. But these issues we're talking about, they're really important, and everyone will admit up front, we don't know what to do, and it's, it's great. And so then what you do is you work with the people in that open-mindedness, and you say, well, wait, we want the people to be in charge when there's a ballot question. We don't want this to be diminished like the school district did in their brief. Oh, the school district has made the decision to issue the bonds. Now we need the people's approval. No, 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 no. This is democracy. If the people have a vote, this vote has been preserved. The fact is... The people make the decision whether to issue the bonds. And the people then want to know if the school district has followed the rules before the election. And that's what the campaign finance requirements require. There, there are all sorts of limitations on you know, contributions, uh, uh, expenditures, how they can be done. And the school district isn't even acknowledging by filing a report that's doing any of that, even though all of us say, well, you mailed the brochure, you did this, you did that, you organized your faculty to do these things. You're campaigning. That's okay. That's not the issue in this lawsuit. But if you're going to be campaigning, you have to report. And so the reason why I think that the court has expressed interest and knowledge of the case is they cause one to think 
about what kind of a culture and what kind of a government we want. And this is the hard work of reforming our political culture around common sense, ordinary language, and democratic sensibilities. So let's let the other side have expertism, elitism, vague notions of the republic. We want the people to be in charge and the people to manage the government to something more excellent. We don't want the government managing the people. We see where that has led us. And so the clear thinking has to come from the people and then we call the government out to a higher standard. And that's the way to win the battle and particularly with the young people. Because the young people, the, uh, uh, authenticity, authenticity is the currency in trade. I'll say it again, authenticity is the currency in trade. If the government appears inauthentic, as it has in these cases, the young people will not have faith in that government. And the only way to restore faith in that government is for us to bring these cases, expose what we think are legal violations, and to have the court bless our work by you know, maybe an occasional victory. And then we say, look, that's redemptive. The courts are there to correct the government when it steers off course from the people's laws. You know, it's not a free-for-all after the people have enacted a law through their legislature. The law is binding on the government agencies. The government agencies can't say, well, the law's passed, now it's a free-for-all. No, the law is the way the, the people manage those agencies. And so it really comes down to the school district, why aren't you following the people's law? Is there any reason you wouldn't? And what kind of an example does it, does it set when a school district which teaches our children to be law-abiding willfully violates the law? It's completely backwards. And the young people see these things, and the young people want to correct them. And that's where we're going to build a sense of community again. All right. Well, we're out of time here. Uh, very, very profound. I really liked what he had to say about the young people uh, because... Uh, they have that sense of, hey, things aren't quite right here. Uh, well, you get it when you're a kid. You understand injustices happening. And now we're seeing that these older people, these elite, are saying, you know, no good. Uh, they're being dishonest. And so you need to engage people. City of Grant, you need to hire this attorney. Not City of Grant, a couple city council. You need to hire him because they're running over you. And he'll stop what Grant's doing and what Modern Media School District's doing. All right. Good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week.